Minister Harsha De Silva, Mr. Adi Godrej, Mr. Blaise Fernandez, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the Gateway of India Dialogue on where geopolitics meets business. The opening session, quite appropriately, is themed on aligning business and strategic goals. In India, there is probably no better place than Mumbai to carry forward such a discussion. The Ministry of External Affairs is particularly pleased to support this event and to partner with Gateway House in this endeavor. An impressive program awaits you all tomorrow, and I would like to thank all those who have made it possible. The connection between business and diplomacy is self-evident. Indeed, business has driven national and group strategies virtually over the entire course of human history. The issue, therefore, is less about correlation and more of the extent of the centrality of business to the formulation of strategy. Indian experience since independence reveals that the growing salience of business at home is reflected abroad as well. An era of greater state control and direction obviously had its particular brand of diplomacy. With changing times and higher growth, a new mindset has gradually come into place. There is a sharper realization that the real strengths of any nation are primarily economic. That, in turn, has led to a growing recognition that business provides the ballast for many of our important international relationships. The ASEAN, the Gulf, the US, and China are examples. It is the primary driver in some, perhaps a little less salient in others, but never entirely absent. In contentious situations, business can serve as a mitigating factor. And where strategic imperatives are less pronounced in Europe, Latin America, or parts of Africa, business is actually our main connect. As we now look beyond narrower economic reform towards a much broader modernization effort, its relevance to our engagement with the world is only stronger. India's approach to aligning business and strategic goals bears some similarity to the experiences of East Asian and Southeast Asian polities as they traversed their particular path of national development. Increasingly, our foreign policy is dominated by the quest for capital, resources, technology, capabilities, and best practices. They have become the benchmarks to judge the success or otherwise, of policies and interactions. It is telling that considerable efforts are invested to encourage the involvement of external partners in development programs like Digital India, Skill India, Smart Cities, or Namami Gange. When a prime minister goes to Hanover to showcase Make in India, or to San Francisco to unveil Startup India, clearly we are entering a different era. It is one where making it easier to do business is a key element of our strategy. Today, every embassy has a designated commercial officer. We are the first port of call, not just for Indian businesses going out, but increasingly for foreign businesses coming in. There is a division in the foreign ministry tasked to handhold foreign investors. Creating a better enabling environment for business is our daily mantra. And addressing the political and regulatory impediments is very much at the heart of our diplomatic agenda. This is a very different foreign service from the one I joined four decades ago. Underlying the endeavor to align business and strategic goals is our shifting understanding of the world itself. A period of extraordinary change began with the end of the Cold War and the economic rise of Asia. It was further underlined by the 2008 crisis that brought out the redistribution of power in the global order. But perhaps even more impactful are the daily consequences of multiple technology revolutions. To a country like India, they offer immense leapfrogging possibilities. It is not just the power hierarchy that is changing. 
the actual interplay of nation states is clearly circumscribed by growing interdependence. The global strategic landscape, in fact, looks increasingly like a business environment. Its key concepts are risk assessments, convergence, margins, competition, leveraging, and hedging. Different partners, some with competing interests, often have to be simultaneously engaged. If operations have become more nuanced, challenges in international politics too are more blurred. Nothing is absolute anymore. Those who can comprehend this changing paradigm will surely get ahead. Conversely, those who cannot are destined to be trapped in old debates. With this background, it's useful to evaluate how India's capabilities and requirements will impinge on its global strategy. Let me begin with resources. In our case, the most important of them being the human one. Whether India really reaps the demographic dividend or not depends on our economic growth, the expansion of manufacturing, the success of skilling initiatives, and the spread of education, literacy, and health. Clearly, these are policy outcomes and not a foregone conclusion. But as prospects improve, we must assess the importance of the availability and accessibility of human resources to an aging world. While there may, ha while there may have political and social repercussions, the economic logic of changing production and skill centers is hard to ignore. Global trade discussions cannot indefinitely front load goods and investments at the cost of services and labor mobility. Then there is the question of how we see the implications of expanding manufacturing at home. Make in India is not make for India. While we may legitimately exploit our domestic market advantages, the real game is to integrate more deeply into the global supply chain and gain better market access abroad. Indeed, striking an optimal balance between these competing factors is at the heart of our trade strategy. Insofar as our resource dependence is concerned, probably the one most worthy of strategizing is that relating to energy. Not coincidentally, it is also the domain that has seen the greatest activism in our recent diplomatic interactions. Where fossil fuel is concerned, one objective is to obtain assured upstream access in producing economies like Russia, Iran, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, or Mexico. Another is to secure greater investment in downstream areas. But with the world moving towards greener and cleaner energy, and given our own commitment to shift to 40% non-fossil power generation capacity by 2030, attention is increasingly shifting to renewables. Our solar energy program has been exceptionally ambitious and gotten off to a flying start. The International Solar, Al solar Alliance Initiative reflects this priority. It is, however, nuclear energy that will constitute the core of this commitment and is therefore central to India's approach to climate change. In that regard, we are in a position now to build on the international cooperation openings that have been negotiated in the last decade and confirmed by the settlement of the liability issue. The path is open, uh, once again, to a substantial increase in domestically produced nuclear power plants while simultaneously moving forward with foreign partners. These large anticipated investments in the nuclear energy sector can, however, only happen in a climate of predictability. In particular, it would require greater certainty of trading rules and technology access. It is our expectation that membership of the nuclear suppliers group can effectively address that concern. A stronger Indian nuclear industry can help make nuclear power more competitive globally. Indeed, as our own nuclear industry expands and we go rapidly beyond the 140 nuclear-related export licenses that we issued last year, it is also in the larger interest that our practices are in conformity with global ones. 
if assured energy is one critical enabler to sustain and accelerate growth, then better connectivity and a modern infrastructure is the second. Considerable diplomatic energies are consequently devoted to this objective where international partnerships can make a big difference. They build on infrastructure initiatives already underway, like the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, but also on more liberal FDI policies recently put in place for sectors like railways, ports, roads, and highways. There has been progress across a broad front with some changes already visible on the ground, others moving out of the drawing board, and still more in different stages of the pipeline. Japan has been a particularly valued partner in this context, but China, some ASEAN members, Europe, and the United States are all coming into play in its many dimensions. These infrastructure developments will certainly have geopolitical repercussions. At the minimum, they would accelerate the global economic rebalancing by helping provide the foundation for India's manufacturing ambitions. But they would also correct historically Im historical imbalances, in particular by developing our eastern coast that was so neglected during the colonial period. In the Ministry of External Affairs, we have a particular responsibility towards the conceptualization and execution of connectivity projects relating to our immediate neighbors, assessing the progress, assessing the progress that we are making I can predict with some confidence that regional connectivity will advance substantially in the next few years. So too will our access to the extended neighborhood. Projects underway in Bangladesh and Myanmar will certainly strengthen our Act East capabilities. On the West, the Chabahar port and other Iran-centered international transit initiatives will give us better access not just to Afghanistan but to Central Asia, Russia, and even to Europe. Our encouragement to business stepping forward is obviously not oblivious to a strategic logic. A related issue is strengthening the ability of Indian businesses to effectively compete abroad. We cannot be impervious to the global trend of batting for your business. Whether it is facilitating credit or access, undertaking networking or advocacy, this is increasingly a legitimate expectation that business has of the government. Building a Team India culture within and beyond the official dam is very much a part of this thinking. That the foreign ministry today uh, has specific divisions to focus on lines of credit, training, and projects abroad underlines this more strategic view of business. But let me also state quite frankly that business too has to do its part if this is to be an effective partnership. That has not always been the case. While the reordering of the global system reflects opportunities that have been seized, they also come with their own burdens and responsibilities. It is evident that ensuring the security of the global commons and responding to its many challenges will increasingly have to be a shared endeavor by virtue of its location, reflecting its ties of kinship and culture, and taking into account its growing commerce. India has a particular obligation in respect to the oceans in the south. We are responding vigorously and effectively through a more integrated strategy. Examples include white shipping agreements, coastal surveillance arrangements, hydrographic surveys, HADR, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, and naval exercises. Indeed, it is this maritime domain that has most expressively demonstrated the alignment that we are discussing. Of all the global challenges, none has captured the world's attention more than the threat of terrorism. Whether it is its orthodox version that this city knows only too well, or the most recent cyber manifestations, the intention remains one of dominating through disruption. National resilience and systemic hardening are obviously part of the answer, but equally important 
are preemptive and responsive policies. International cooperation in this regard has consequently come to occupy a very important place in our diplomatic agenda. While this is a subject in itself, let me just state that events have shown that a reputational downgrade is as damaging for a nation as it is for a company. To sum up, a comparison of statements and outcomes of Indian diplomacy over the last many decades will bring out how much more central economic and developmental issues have become to our external engagements. No high level visit is complete today without a business event. Ensuring market access and responding to investor concerns are taken as a given. The advancement of flagship programs is clearly a key thrust. Enhancing national branding is a major preoccupation. Most important, a more global business outreach has widened the horizons of Indian diplomacy. A new normal is in the making, one where the business of Indian diplomacy is increasingly business. Thank you very much.